Space is vast, so vast that even our tiny local pocket called the solar system has a size which defies ordinary understanding. If the Earth were shrunk down to the size of a pea, then Pluto, which would now be the size of a flea, would lie at a colossal seven kilometers away. Over the last few decades, humans have constructed a handful of small machines that we've flung out into the dark to explore a cosmic backyard. Sensory extensions designed to give us our first glimpses of what lies beyond our cosmic shoreline. Faced with these interplanetary distances, which are meager by the universe's standards, but epic by our own, trying to communicate with these probes is like trying to hear a distant whisper on the wind. As if the universe were not hostile enough to us already, its immense scale means that even simple communication is a major challenge. Presently, our most distant orbiter probe is the Juno spacecraft, which was designed to study Jupiter, our closest giant planet. It's a mission which has returned unprecedented insights into how Jupiter's atmosphere is structured and behaves, as well as many spectacular images that have captivated the public. Juno sends this data back to us using its high-gain antenna, which, at 2.5 meters across, is literally as big as they could physically make it, yet still able to fit inside the rocket fuselage. With Jupiter being over five times further away from the Sun than the Earth is, Juno's solar cells trickle in 27 times less flux, making power a precious commodity. And so when Juno fires up its high-gain antenna and tries to send data back to Earth, a distance of 500 billion miles, it does so with just 27 watts of power. That's less than an incandescent light bulb. As this radio signal travels across the ocean of space, the wave spreads out, just like how waves spread out in water. This spreading out, known as diffraction, causes the energy of the wave to diffuse over an ever larger region, and so by the time it reaches the Earth, it's barely detectable. To give us the best chance possible of detecting Juno's whispers across the dark, we use giant 70-meter receivers known as the Deep Space Network, DSN. To give you a sense of how difficult this is, when DSN listens to Juno, its colossal 70-meter receiving dish is only able to soak up 200 attowatts of power from Juno. That's 0.000000000000002 watts of power. It is completely ridiculous that we are able to detect that, let alone use it for useful communication. Data transmission rates are limited by the bandwidth and signal to noise of your receiver. So, the more power you receive, the higher the signal to noise. The power is so small here that this is a major limiting factor, and thus Juno is only able to transmit data back at about 200 kilobits per second. That's about the same as dial-up modems, meaning that each three-color 1600p image takes about a minute to download from Juno. For context, that's about 500 times slower than the average American's internet connection. Those of you old enough to remember know that dial-up modem speeds are painful to work with. There is simply a huge amount of data that we cannot download off the spacecraft. It means things like live streaming or delayed telepresence, high-resolution video are simply out of reach. And so, is this the best we can do? Are we forever limited to grainy images downloading at pedestrian speeds? Or could that be? another way.
In my last video, I talked about a special project for me, something that I've been thinking about for 13 years now, the Terrascope. I'm going to direct you to the video for the details, but the basic idea is that the Earth's atmosphere refracts, bends light, and thus can serve as a lens. And therefore, we can turn the Earth's atmosphere into a giant telescope. This idea was inspired by the earlier proposal by von Eschlemann of using the Sun as a gravitational lens. The main advantage over that idea is that the telescope's focus point is about the same as the Earth-Moon orbit, whereas the Sun's gravitational focus is outside of the solar system altogether. Now, what has this got to do with Juno and data transmission rates? You are probably rightly asking yourself at this point in the video. Well, it has long been recognized that this solar gravitational lens could not only be used as a telescope, but it could also be used as an antenna. Instead of placing a detector at the solar focus, one could put a transmitter. Emissions from the transmitter spread out as a wave just like before, but now, when they reach the sun, gravitational lensing amplifies the light, bringing it back into a sharp beam. Now, as others have noted, this would be a fantastic system for interstellar communication, potentially linking distant stars together. But it's not going to work within the solar system for interplanetary communication. And that's because this focus point at 550 AU is simply far too distant. So this is where the telescope comes in, because the telescope has a focus point which is much closer to home and thus could potentially serve as a solution. Just like the solar lens, we can reverse the direction of light in the antenna to turn our telescope into an antenna. An antenna of planetary proportions. Let's now return to Juno orbiting Jupiter. Jupiter is a gas giant, and so certainly has an atmosphere comprising of largely hydrogen and helium. That atmosphere will refract electromagnetic radiation just like the Earth does, and so in principle we could conceive of a Joviscope, the same idea just using Jupiter instead of the Earth. Now, one might naively think that Jupiter's far greater size will lead to far greater amplification using this effect, but that intuition is actually wrong. As I showed in my paper, the amplification is directly proportional to the scale height of the atmosphere, not actually the size of the planet itself. For Jupiter, its scale height is only about three times greater than that of the Earth, and that's largely because of Jupiter's strong gravity pinning the atmosphere down. But nevertheless, a factor of three increase is something I would happily take. Okay, so let's now use Jupiter's atmosphere as an antenna. With Juno's transmitter of diameter 2.5 meters and Jupiter's more extended scale height, I estimate that Jupiter could amplify Juno's signals by approximately 70,000. Now, I must caution that this number assumes that Jupiter's upper atmosphere is not opaque to the 8.4 GHz radio frequency used by Juno. Another concern one might have is whether Jupiter's focus point is even accessible to Juno. Maybe Juno's too close. A precise calculation of the Joviscope inner focus point would require some detailed atmospheric modeling, and that would be a big project, something I have not yet done. But we can crudely estimate from simple geometry that the focus point as compared to the Earth should move out by about the ratio of radii between those two planets. So, for the Earth, the focus is about 300,000 kilometers, and thus I would estimate that the Joviscope focus line begins at about 3 million kilometers. In truth, we actually need to double that distance now to account for the fact that Jupiter's hydrogen-rich atmosphere bends light by only about half as much as telluric air, giving us a final distance of something like 6 million kilometers. Now, if you were any closer to Jupiter than this distance, it would not be possible to exploit this atmospheric lensing effect of the Joviscope. And so that raises the obvious question, 
Is Juno far enough away from Jupiter to be able to do this? In short, yes. Juno resides in a wide elliptical orbit, with its furthest separation, known as Apogeove, being 8.1 million kilometers away from Jupiter, comfortably beyond the inner focus. It's kind of interesting to note that Juno is actually supposed to conduct what's called a period reduction maneuver in 2017 and come in much closer to Jupiter, far closer than the Joviscope focus. Had it had done so, then a Joviscope would not be possible. Now, in the end, the team decided not to do this because of problems on board with Juno with the helium valves, which are actually important during the main engine burns. So it seems as though these helium valves somehow conspired to give us a chance of maybe one day testing out this Joviscope idea. Fate protects fools, little children, and ships named Enterprise. So it seems as though Juno really could utilize this lensing effect to test out the telescope idea more broadly. But what would this test actually look like? Well, in order for us to use Jupiter as an antenna and send a signal back to Earth, then we require alignment between these three points. So we would actually need that apogee point to line up with Jupiter and the Earth in order for us to be able to detect the signal back on Earth. Assuming it's possible to nudge Juno's orbit into the correct position, Juno would then fire up its transmitter, and DSN should be able to detect the transmission amplified by a factor of about 70,000. If we see that, then we have our validation. Now I know many of you are probably wondering, is this just all talk, or is there a chance that Juno might actually do this test for real? Well, all I can really say is that I have contacted and reached out to the Juno team and asked about the possibility, and I've not heard back. But honestly, I, I really can't blame Juno for not wanting to do this. I mean, this is certainly not part of their mission objectives, and it may represent just too much risk for them to modify the orbit to do this test. And after all, let's face it, the telescope idea is very new. I mean, I really can't blame anyone for being skeptical about its claims. However, maybe there is just a slim chance that this idea might work. Well, if it's right, what would that mean? On July 30th, 2021, less than two years away from now, Juno will crash into Jupiter after being issued one last command. What if, in between now and then, the Joviscope idea is tested and works? With an amplification of 70,000, the signal-to-noise received by DSN would be enhanced by 265 times, increasing the data transmission rate by approximately the same amount. So, we'd go from 200 kilobits per second download speeds to 53 megabits per second download speeds. That's about the same as your 4G LTE connection speed on your cell phone. Enough to comfortably live stream 4K video from Jupiter. It's also worth highlighting that in many ways, using atmospheric lensing to create a giant antenna is easier than using it as a telescope. That's because when we use it as a telescope, the planet's own light has to be removed using a large shade to block out all of that nuisance signal. But when we use it as an antenna, there is no need for this shade, because planets in general do not produce much emission at these very specific communication frequencies that we typically use. Now, the further from Earth we go, the greater the drop-off in data rates. But there's enough bandwidth to play with here that we could even go to Alpha Centauri and use the exoplanetary atmospheres to reach about a kilobit per second, enough to download a high-res photo every few hours. 
One could even imagine going further and using not only this distant planet as a giant antenna, but when that signal comes back to the Earth, we can use the Earth as the original telescope concept again and use it as a giant receiving dish, creating a kind of atmospheric bridge between these two distant worlds. And that would allow us to get this amplification effect two times over. And so, perhaps, the telescope concept could find its best use not as a telescope, but as an antenna. A high-speed internet across the solar system, each planet linked to the other, arm in arm, using worlds as our antenna and modems. Maybe you'd tune into a live stream from Saturn, minus an hour light travel time, or explore Venus with a telepresence android, or Perhaps watch a grainy video broadcast from another star system altogether. I believe that when we dream big, we can accomplish wonders. We can either accept the world the way it is, or we could try to use our time to make it better. Let's try to make sure that we leave a brighter future for those that follow after us. And so, until the next video, stay thoughtful and stay curious.